Good morning, viewers, and welcome again to another episode of In Our Community. I'm your host, Jim Ducey, and we're talking again today with Philip Domonte, the owner and operator of King Philip Independent Living Facility in San Jose. Uh, in our last conversation, we talked mostly about how residents get referred to uh, the independent living facility from social service agencies, from mental health facilities, and from law enforcement agencies. Today we'd like to talk more about uh, Philip's interaction with the residents themselves. So that's going to be the main topic of our conversation. I did want to clear up a couple of things from our last conversations. We had mentioned NAMI, N-A-M-I, as a referral source for residents coming to the facility. And I'd like you to explain a little bit more what NAMI is and how they end up as a referral source for you. I'm sorry, good morning, Thanks. Philip. It's good to see good you. Good morning, yes, good morning. And I'm very happy uh, we're doing this again. I'm, 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 I, I've been told, Mark, we're very lucky because you are having this another v um, conversation with us to share what we do here at King Philip Independent Living. And I would like the, our viewers to know how uh, good it is. And we're fortunate to, to take care of this individual. So thank you again for having me. A pleasure. So yeah, so uh, a little bit about NAMI. Yeah, NAMI. Uh, what is NAMI stand for? N A M I, National um, Alliance for Mental Illness. And it's a nonprofit organization, and it's a whole group in the whole United States. And they have different offices in different state, different county, or even city, so who are suffering mental illness. So they are the one that three main things that they like they are doing for. One is to intervene early. Uh, secondly, we have the, uh, the help to improve the care of the individuals and also uh, they divert the individuals from justice. What does that mean for divert from individuals for justice? They cannot be just, um, if they do something uh, differently um, in terms of their behavior because it's out of their control, you know, there's a something different assessment for them. So they're not gonna be, uh, be handcuffed. So they have to get treatment first instead of uh, taking them to a cost of it. So those are the ones that they're three men lead they're looking at. So it's okay. totally different okay. with this individual. Okay, that's good, thank you. Uh, the, uh, in our first conversation a couple of months ago, you had mentioned that you don't need a license to operate an independent living facility in San Jose, but you do have up to 16 people, residents, who can be living in your house uh, mm -hmm. and they're unrelated people. Does this operate as a, uh, like an apartment or how is it zoned? How is it that you work with the city? So um, the only um, one of the permits that you get, there are two kinds of fictitious from the, from the uh, county and for the city is the business tax certificate to operate the business. So in the beginning, I was asking them, um, hey guys, I'm starting to have this business. What kind of regulations do you have? What are your requirements? And when I, when I share to them, what, what are your services for? Who are your clients? And then they say, oh, you just only need this uh, business tax certificate because you're non-licensed. Um, all you have to do is just like consider the zoning in your area. So different zip codes, different location, there are certain numbers of people only who can live in, in that house. So, but if you are, if you're beyond that number, come back to us and apply for uh, that, what they call reasonable accommodation. And what they require is uh, a plan, a sketch plan of your house, um, the size of the room, bring it to the building, they call it the building code uh, enforcement in the city, and they will review your application. They will come here and, and look at your room, the size of the house, and they will be the one to determine, like, Philip, you can only put three people in this room. This master bedroom, you can only get through a four or three. So they are the one to make that determination. Okay. Same well, thing good. is like. So now, um, do 
do they do, do how about the referral agencies like social services agencies do they come out and look at the facility or do they once once they've seen it and they know that you're complying with the city regulations then everything is fine that that's true so initial process is that they call us and oh, right yeah, they call us and some of them, they already visited our website and they already know what we're doing, have an idea what we're doing. They call us and they schedule an appointment because second step of the process is we would like to see the client sure. ourselves to interview. And then we would like our client also to experience the house to see if this is the right place for you. So get to know that with them, uh, with the clients and the staff. And then from there, the, the agency will have a lot, some questions about how we've been operating, what uh, services you have, what can't you uh, accept to this uh, kind of housing. And then from there, once we all met in, in, the, in the middle where the client is fit for the facility or for the house, and then we'll proceed with the next step, which is a moving process. Okay. So they will okay. come and visit it. Okay, all right, well, that's good. So uh, now the last time we had talked about the environment. So you uh, provide for your residents, you know, a place to live and you provide mm -hmm. meals. Uh, and also you have daily activities and you have celebrations like for birthdays and holidays and things. So um, I'd like to talk in today's episode about the one-on-one -on -one interactions with the residents. So now everyone who is a resident there has some mental or behavioral challenge they're dealing with. Uh, how is it that you interact with them? Uh, you know, we are gonna run into a range of behavioral uh, challenges, things that people act out and such. How is it that you work with people? You know, Jim, I'm, uh... That is very good question, and it brings a lot of factors and elements in terms of the daily operations itself. It's not only about the meals and not only about the daily activities or anything else. It's the major thing in there is that you are asking for is the behavioral challenges that we deal every day, and it's something like. Um, even just a little thing, you'll be surprised. Like, oh, just a little thing, but it make a big deal, right? So. Uh, there are a lot of them, such as argument with each other. And once you come up with the, with, um, the solution and to try to find out what's the cause of it, and sometimes, you know, it's all about the, the, the channel on the TV mm -hmm. or, or somebody's like sitting on the other side of the couch, which is the other person like to sit on the other couch, mm -hmm. you know? So, so and another thing is um, the roommate's issue because they share a room. Some, some of them, they read paper or book before they go to bed with the lights on and the other roommate does, doesn't support that, you know, or someone's watching TV at 12 o'clock, so, but the other guy, they should be all, we should be all sleeping at 10 o'clock, that kind of thing. So a lot of factors that you see there is, and, and during mealtime also. So it is, no matter what that, you encounter with every day, you, we have to be prepared. We have to be, uh, uh, dig, know how to dig the uh, problems. Where is it coming from? How do you uh, solve it? So we have to have a set of uh, problem solving strategies with different uh, um, behaviors that you deal with. And the most important there is that person itself to make sure that at the end of that conversation or solution, we have to satisfy them. And hopefully it's not gonna happen again. So, so I think what you're doing is conflict resolution a lot of times. So now why something becomes a big issue for someone may just have to do with their coping mechanisms. But I mean, put any 16 people together in a room and you're gonna have personality conflicts. So if people are living with each other day after day after day, of course, you're going to have those kinds of things. But you have a certain way of dealing with these. You've told everyone at the beginning, 
if we have a problem, we're going to sit down and talk about it. We're going to figure out what's wrong and how we can work with it. All right. Yes. So tell us what some of those. So can can the the things that bring up these conflicts can they be um, environment related? Can they be something about their medications? doesn't really matter the cause, you still have to get down to the bottom and make sure they feel like you're listening to them and you're working with the problem. So tell us how an interaction like that might work. Yeah, so uh, that's part of the problem solving. We have to know mm -hmm. what are the cause for it. It's uh, well, number one is always the personality uh, conflict with each other. So it's, that's include the environment, um, medications, so some of them may not be compliant with the medication because they're not, you know, uh, they forget. And this individual who live here, they manage their own medication and they, they uh, forget or sometimes they just re refuse to take their medications. You know, um, communications also. So that's another factor that, you know, you, you see there. Sometimes because of their different language and different other person, they misunderstood to each other and they may think that the, the person is talking about that person. Um, physical factors, such as somebody who's in pain, you know, and if you're in pain and it, your personality change. Oh, for sure. Just a little say good, good morning to that person, how are you doing? And sometimes they don't respond pretty good because that pain itself. Um, so that's, those are few factors that contribute to those. So you are, um, be re you are ready to know that first. And not only that, because you understand where is it coming from, you have to understand that part. And also you have to help the other resident and staff to understand that part also. So just, you know, if I know that the person having an issue with that pain, and then when you ask simple question and he yell at you so we're not going to stop in there i will have to share it with the roommates the staff and give them a warning and say you know when you start talking to that person and you know that because of, with a certain condition i want you guys to understand instead of um responding in the different uh, manner where it can cause a, a problem so so we can eliminate from there because you're already uh giving them idea how to uh, avoid that. So, mm -hmm. so those are the initial factors that we have to get in first to avoid it. We try to avoid it before that happens. If something happens, then what's another uh, problem solving strategy that mm -hmm. we can offer for them? Okay, so now you, th that brings up an important point is that as you get to know their personalities and you know what their normal day-to-day, -day, even keel kind of mood is, you can recognize when things are starting to go off track. And yeah. then you, you learn how to deal with different people in different ways. So what kinds of things do you look at to recognize things? They're not eating well, they're not sleeping well. Mm -hmm. As you say, they can be real snappy or have a mood swing or something. So you recognize these things and try to to bring them back before things go wrong. Yeah, thanks again for bringing that up too, for uh, getting to that deeper part of that portion. Um, if you are well-trained and know your your strategy for this one, you should be able to assess also the person with even because they will not going to come to you. Your ears and your eyes and your brain for evaluation will tell you what is going on with a person. And, and, and it's not just because you observe or they come to you. Um, the most important role that you have as an owner or operator is to be spending time with them because the most important time that you spend with them, you will learn about their personality. You will learn about the baseline. So you can base from there. And if there's something going on or change with that person, you can detect that right away. So this person is very calm. Uh, every time I go there and have a conversation with a person, but after a few days, there's something changed. It's not talking or um, yelling. So for you, oh, this is not your baseline. So there's something going on. Now, next step, let's figure out what's going on with that person. So uh, 
I can give you one example. If um, because these individuals are are going out, they're, they're independent. They have access going anywhere to, to, to the public. And what is, what's happening there? They can have potentially be uh, dealing with individuals who are um, using drugs, alcohol, you know, or drug, any drug, uh, any, any kind of crimes, right? And they come home, they may bring a piece of those things, you know? So um, I can tell, you know, by looking at their eyes, you know, their eyes dilated, it's because they are intoxicated. Mm -hmm. um, you can tell already if they are um, intoxicated with alcohol, right? So that drugs itself, you can, you can tell. And the way, the way they, they move, the way they talk is totally different. And it's so time for you. What do you do about them. these kind of violations of the house rules? I mean, do you give them warnings or do you talk to the social worker, their caseworker? How do you deal with that kind of a situation where somebody is just not complying with the rules? Right. So these individuals already know that they have violated the rules already. Oh my God, I, I drank outside. I, I intoxicated or I used this drug. They know when they come back, I'm going to deal with Phil because he knows what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Right. So first step we're going to do we have a little chat with that person in a calm way because, you know, those are individual intoxicated already. If you don't manage it properly too, it can lead to, a, you know, um, it could be abusive manner, right? They get mad. So we have to get that um, in a very professional and calm manner. Next step, we have to let the social worker know, this is what I observe. Um, and then they will come in as well. They can bring uh, another social worker with them or their supervisor. So they're going to have that conversation with a person and they will let me know, yeah, Philip, it's confirmed. This is uh, intoxicated or this person is using this, right? So, so we work together and then we'll, we'll um, the plan, it could be, can we remove you from the house right now because of your behavior? It depends on how this person reacts. How serious it is and how frequent it becomes. Right, and how frequent it becomes. Now you, we don't feel that you're safe in the house. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think that you are fit at this moment. So they may have to take that person somewhere else for, for detoxication. So from that process, and then we will have another meeting with the client and review what happened in the past and let's go back to the house rule. Hey, this is what happened. Remember that five, five few days ago. Now it's time to, to talk about it again because you are already clean. So we reviewed it again. Now it's our decision. Can I give you a chance or can we just proceed because this is the second time, the third time, we're not gonna do it again unless the, the client would say, Philip, this is my final time. I don't want to leave here. I promise I'm not going to leave again. We always give the chance for that individual. Of course. Of course. All right. So uh, your, your degree, your college degree is in restaurant and hotel management. And it sounds like you've become a, a psychologist over the years of, of working. Amateur psychologist. <laughs> What's that? We, we all like amateur psychologists, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true, but this is a very big part of your job. What other staff do you have there that, that works at the house? So we have, you know, because we're very limited in terms of what kind of service we provide. Sure. So the main one is the, the, uh, the meals only, you know? So we have cooks, um, two of them, and um, mostly I help them as well if I'm, if I'm in the house and, you know, um, we do a little activities for everybody. So it's, it's just, it's just a, actually a total of three of us. Three people. So, so you, yeah. you are the main operator and you're the one who really deals with all of the personal issues because that's your responsibility. That's, and that's true. Other two people clean, cook, uh, and work on doing the parties and activities that you have around the house. Okay. That's, that's true. Okay, so now, uh, personally, this seems like a lot. 
how do you feel like you have the, the strength and motivation to work in this kind of an environment for as your as your primary primary work you know um with all these challenges that we face every day uh with our clients um in the beginning from day one since i started this business um the the mission and vision that we're holding on so Putting that mission and vision, it's something that you'll be prepared also. It's not like what you're meeting and what you're trying to do with the individuals. But if at the end of the day, after you resolve some issue and help your residents with some challenges that they uh, encounter with, well, I, I, I always call that a second paycheck, you know, a second paycheck where you feel like if I didn't do that for him, where is he now? You know, if I don't uh, help him today, is he somewhere else where he's suffering? Or if I don't do this, if I don't help him today, he may be living there in a, a homeless camp and dealing with hot or cold weather. So that is where I'm getting from. Think about that, you know, it's only like few minutes challenge that you deal with, but for the rest of your life, you can always claim that because of you, because of your skills and your compassion, that person is doing well and still living at your house, yeah. you know? So that's why you're there as, as, uh, to advocate them. They, they can't control it. It's their illness. So that's why you're there to support. God give, give them yourself. So, or you're there to please help these individuals because you have capable to do it. That's what I always see it every day. Yeah. And it's really, even though it's challenging, but that is, fight for that, it. Is, that is really good. And that's inspirational what you do. So thank you for that. I do yeah. want to, uh, we just have a couple minutes left. I'd like you to share a few words about the service that you provide. So when you think of all of the different ways that people can live in the world, you know, from being completely homeless to your average single family home or, you know, how do you see your residents, where they fit in that social structure? And um, something to the viewers about how you are helping this segment, this part of society, that really are, are kind of sheltered from the rest of us in our normal, normal lives. You know, um, if you drive around San Jose, you see a lot of, uh, homeless camp everywhere and they've and seeing them and you know it's too cold outside or it's raining you will think about why these people living here and i have my own home i have my own heater and i can drink or use a bathroom anytime i want you know um it hurts you but at the same time um what else i can do to to help these individuals, right? So, but if you're running a place like this, it's not about business. It's not about what you're making money for. It is uh, the fact that if I don't have this business right now, where are these people now? Are they one of them there that I see a few minutes ago? You know, so, and compliment yourself saying that, I help a little bit, some, or I touch somebody else's life. Mm -hmm. you know, that person may be living there now, or now because I, start, I have this uh, kind of operational kind of housing, they're here, living, living at the same house, getting food three meals a day, and they have a warm blanket at night. So that is something that I can see as part of the contribution that I can give to the city or and, and the whole humankind, you know, it is, uh, it, it is, uh, it's a good thing. It feels good about it. Um, and I don't look at it as a business. It is something like I'm doing something every single day for these individuals. That's something so that's that is, that's something that has come through very clearly in all of our conversations that you, you, yeah. you don't really look on this as a business. You look on this as what you can do for, for people who, 
have have issues that have problems and you're doing your best to do something for them as i said it's very inspirational and very helpful to, yeah to all. i would i would like to share one thing jim when um sometimes i get a phone call and i have somebody just drop by you know last uh video that we made we talk about those individuals who are successfully live in the house and they yeah. ended up uh having their own place it's like great. apartment or so so you know they call us and say philip you remember me i lived there for six months and then oh yeah i do remember you and they're like i'm calling you just just to let you know that i want to thank you for helping me to become independent and helping me to be the best person of me. A quick phone call from somebody who just woke up in the morning, right? Yeah. And, and, and sometimes you might say, oh, you're welcome. That's very simple to say welcome, but sometimes you don't know what to say. You don't know how to respond to it. Like it, it hurt, it, it, it's, um, it touched your heart and at the same time your heart Close in there, like, oh, what should I say? What, I, what can I respond to that one? It's because you, you recognize something that what you did many years ago, and it will come back to you. And this person, like, how do you know my number still after all these years, right? And then what, what, you, what do you came up with? Like, one day you call me and say that. There's something good happening to that person. And because of that, something happened good with that person, put yourself together. Hey, we did this together. It's not only you and not only me. We did it together. That's and I'm right. proud of you that you're that's there. Right. So well, that's, that's why, like, and that you is, feel like <laughs> that really has got to feel good. That really is, is the thing that it is. makes it all worthwhile. So. It is. I'm glad for what you've done, and thank you so much for talking to us about all the all the challenges and the benefits and all of the all of the good things that it brings to you in your life. So thanks very much, Philip, and good luck with uh, running King Philip Independent Living in the future. Appreciate your taking the time. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for having me again. Well, thank you, viewers, and again, this has been an episode of In Our Community. And I'm your host, Jim Ducey. Join us again for another episode, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks a lot. Bye.